Hi, I'm Dave Neff with the Carnegie Historical Museum located on South Court Street. And I'm Joe Hunt, uh, living here in Fairfield on 1103 Loudon Drive, and I'm uh, on the board as well as the treasurer of Carnegie. The one thing is that we've known each other all the way back into the 1960s when we were at Parsons College, and now we get a chance to share our ambition to help with the history of Fairfield and keep the Carnegie Public Museum uh, in motion on that. Uh, let's see, what's, what's our first thing here? Uh, this first thing, Dave, is uh, on the uh, museum attendance. Uh, you might just give us a heads up on how things are going and what the museum's doing based on all some of their activities that they've got going these days. Good. We have had more fun. Uh, we were shut down quite a bit during the pandemic. But since then, with rehabilitation, building new structures and things, pe people have really turned out for us. We started out January, February with 86, 87. The weather got better, 137 in March, 143 in April, 139. But June, weather got good, 218. July, 259. August, 292. And then September came, 291. 289 in October, November, so we're talking 2,115 people that have come through our doors to see the activities and what we have posted on there. Uh, during the summer months especially, uh, class reunions want to return to Fairfield High School, and we were fortunate enough to host 13 class reunions for them to come back and see firsthand and relive some of the things that they had when they were growing up in Fairfield. We feel very, very blessed that those folks choose it and then they become supporters and invite families and other people to come back and get a chance to see what, what has happened. And these were once again mainly during the summer months, but boy, the numbers continue to grow. Yeah, and you know, Dave, I think too that as the years, as the months go along here, we're gonna see in the future more and more increases in attendance and it kind of leads into our second uh, topic here about uh, the Christmas tree program that uh, we've got going into the museum. Uh, more and more families are coming back and if you could explain a little bit of how that works as far as family connections with the trees and so forth and sure. the sales program we've got going. That'd be fine. We have been <clears throat> blessed. This is the second year. This was a vision that uh, my wife Sherry and I had. We ran it past the board and they said, sure, let's, let's give it a try as a fundraiser. Uh, we've been able to use Atwood Christmas trees up close to Packwood on the Brookfield Road heading out. That's Brookfield out towards Packwood there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so a year ago was our first run at it. And we have space. We have 25 trees that we purchase. And our committee, Joe's involved in it, Kathy Talonair, uh, Therese Kaminsky, myself, other folks help out. But we purchased 25 trees, and last year we sold 24 of the 25 trees. So our gross amount of income was $5,000. Being the first year, we had wiring, we had uh, uh, poles, we had other things that we had to pay for the first year, but still selling 24 out of 25 with a gross of $5,000 that we can use for projects uh, around the museum. This year, uh, and whether it's because uh, the population is healthier or whatever. To date, we have only sold 14 trees. I just got notice since I printed this, there's another tree that is wanted. And so our gross amount right now is 2,650. So by the time we're done, we may reach $3,000 that we can use for projects in the museum. But uh, we place these on the, the southeast corner uh, along Court Street and, and along Washington and we provide the lights, we provide a tag, we provide the electricity, and then the individual families, then they decorate it to uh, match the family member they're honoring on that. So it's, it's working well and we'll, we'll get those finished up. You might, you might tell everyone too about how, what the procedure is as far as when we plug in the lights and, and uh, uh, all the families can see what's going on and all the decorations and hard work they put into their trees. We, we have decided that we don't want to upstage anybody. The uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Fairfield Lighting Committee <coughs> on the square, they work so hard at it, so we coordinate. And at the same time that they are doing their lighting that Friday after Thanksgiving, when all the families are home and things, that is the time that we watch 
and hear them count down. And once their lights go on, then we will turn our trees on uh, at, the, at the Carnegie. Uh, we will leave them up through the New Year's. And during that, after that first week uh, of the New Year, we ask that the uh, families that have done the decorations, uh, please come and pick them up. And by that next weekend, then we're ready to remove them and to get the posts out of the ground and store the cords and the lights until next year. Yeah, and, and you mentioned cords there. Uh, the first year uh, that uh, we started the program, we did have a, an investment in cords, power cords, uh, the lights, the, the posts and so forth. And so as each year goes on now, we'll be able to uh, not have to do that every year, which means we'll have more money to go into our profit side of the fundraising program right. that we've got going. And we can use it for special projects uh, over and above what the city budget would normally allow us to do on that. Uh, Dave, the next thing I see is our uh, new display of old friends. Uh, you might tell us a little bit about that. I know right now we're going through the uh, uh, stage where we're taking a lot of the old display uh, artifacts out and preparing for this new display. So Dave, you might explain a little bit the interesting story on how that all came about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie decided back in the 1800s that he was going to provide money to build libraries, but also he wanted museums included in these. Carnegie was from the state of Pennsylvania. The first four museum displays were done in Pennsylvania. The next one, thanks to uh, Senator James F. Wilson from our area, convinced him. So he, our, our museum that you come to visit on South Court Street is the fifth museum in the entire complex of Carnegie Libraries Museums. Um, currently, there are over 1,500 of these around the country. So we were on the very early, early take of it. And during that time, uh, our Senator James Wilson in the 1890s reached out to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. and said, if you have extra items, duplicate items, we'd be more than happy to take them and bring them to Fairfield, Iowa. And so a number of these still survive, and Wilson negotiated the, the donation to the Fairfield Library Museum. Uh, these have been in the display, but they have never been highlighted. And so one of the next projects is to reinstitute, refresh, maybe paint some backgrounds, do some other things mm -hmm. to highlight these that have been really since the building was built back in the 1850s and so along the way. And uh, once it was constructed then in the 1890s, this is when Senator Wilson started bringing in from uh, the Smithsonian on that. And, and the interesting thing too, Dave, that I, I like about this program is, see these, these uh, artifacts that we're going to have in this display came in, in, as Dave said, back in the 1890s and uh, in a crate that came from the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian people, uh, what they would do is they would take a picture of all those artifacts that went into that specific container. And what you're going to see when you come to the museum is you're going to see what it looked like in 1890s, all the same display up in that uh, display case. So it's going to be real interesting to see. Uh, you're, I'm sure you're going to be uh, surprised at uh, what the, the team has come up with this time. I like the way you describe it as a team because we have a bunch of individuals that have sincere interest and they want to make good things happen. And uh, with Mark Schaefer as our, as our leader, director, uh, Jake Schmidt is full time with us and assistant. he is assistant director, curator, and he has a vision for things that the way he'd like to see them. But Joe's involved, I'm involved, my wife Sherry's involved. Kathy Talonair is a former board member, but she's there full time. Uh, we have Therese Kaminsky. We have um, our insurance man. Sean? Sean, yep. Sean McCarty. John McCarty, and then uh, John Morrissey is our, uh, is our legal counsel on that. And we just have brought on Sandy Gillespie as our most recent member. So we have people that have been involved, involved in Fairfield over their lives that now want to make a commitment to improve the history uh, retention for everybody in Fairfield and Jefferson County on that. The, um, um, you'll have to watch for our announcement when this display is done because it'll be real interesting to see just uh, what we end up with there. 
Uh, the next item is uh, we, apparently on October 14th, Dave, we had the Iowa Public Television video crew here, and they were uh, filming around the museum and so forth. And Dave, you can kind of tell us a little bit about what they're up to. Many people who have driven through the New Chicago area on 4th Street have seen a rock that says Iowa's first state fair. And Fairfield had it two years in a <coughs> row. And IPTV, Iowa Public Television, decided they wanted to do a history of the Iowa State Fair. So what, are, what a better place to begin than where it was first formed and built. And so uh, the centennial happened in 1954, so 1854 was the very first Iowa State Fair. 1854, 1855, these were held. Uh, there's a gentleman in our community who has not been here that entire length of time, but he did with the Centennial in 1954. His parents were alive and well and involved, but he was on hand to reminisce about this 1954 Centennial Caravan where 509 people from Fairfield, 471 horses, and 40 covered wagons traveled from Fairfield to Des Moines to mark this 100th anniversary. Mike Carlson was still active and involved when they did 150. And so that was back here um, 10, well, 50, 20 years ago almost. And uh, he got to ride again, uh, Dick Reed, a few other folks that were around in 54, but they got a chance and they rode their horses all the way to Des Moines, had their overnight stops, but there was a caravan that came from Fairfield all the way to the State Fair in Des Moines. And they celebrated 150 years. Of, of that. So it is a remarkable story and how the fair has grown from its original origins here in Fairfield, Jefferson County, Iowa on that. And Dave, also there's, uh, if you're around the museum, you'll hear the word past perfect. And um, th this has been a software program that we put into the museum that helps us track artifacts. And Dave, you might give us a little background just how what our progress is and where we're headed. First of all, before I forget, I want to thank two individuals, uh, Chris Small and Therese Kaminsky. Uh, been involved with our board uh, and they have really reached out to learn, <clears throat> to learn the program, to make it happen. But this is a, a program, as Joe said, called Past Perfect where you list the item, you give it a number, you take a photo of it, you do research on it. And so this way, not just Fairfield, but people from around the country are able to reach in and access, review and learn about items that we take for granted that have been with us for many, many years along the way. We're talking so far that 6,000 items that are in that museum have been cataloged, researched, and photographed, assigned a number, so that uh, they're part of the permanent records on that. But it is, uh, it's been great. We, in fact, we just are in the process of approving getting a, a new program uh, for our computers because uh, some of the older units that have been around are on their last round of, uh, of activity. And so we're upgrading, and with this, we're upgrading the Past Perfect that will provide the access to those records for people on that. Yeah, some of the things I hear about too that they're doing is it's pretty detailed when they go to input all this data into the past perfect on a certain type of artifact. Besides what Dave said about taking pictures and describing it a little bit, they also put the history and they, they designate what category of historical value it might be. And more important than anything, the location of where it's kept in the museum so that we really, if somebody were to walk off the street and come in and have a certain interest in a certain type of Indian pottery or something to that effect, um, they could pull it up on the computer, we'd know where it's at, and they could give that person doing the research information that they might need for their, for their project work. Great opportunity to share all the artifacts that we have and for people to immediately access, see what mm -hmm. they're looking for on there. And the last thing here uh, uh, has to do with, and some of you probably seen it outside as you drove by the museum, is our new signage that we've got there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of stonework that's in process, and Dave, you might give us a heads up on that. Parsons College was in Fairfield for 98 years. Joe and I both attended and graduated from Parsons College, so this, this hits home for us. When the campus was being renovated by Maharishi University, 
uh, one building that one of the buildings that was said we, we need to it's lived its life was the Bar Height Chapel. And there were a number of people that were able to retain, maintain, and store the Bar Height Chapel sandstone. And it stayed dormant for a while, and now it has been used uh, in a number of places around on the southeast corner of our property. Uh, another Parsons alumni, Pete Nelson of the Nelson Company, uh, built a monument of Bar Height stone and it has different cornerstones from the Bar Height Chapel, from the Parsons Hall, from other buildings on campus. I think there's three or four cornerstones dating back to the 1810 in that era, 1910, excuse me. And so with this stone that had been stored, uh, my wife, Sherry Blauneff, when the chapel was taken down, she stored it, kept it, and then we've been married for 15 years and brought it out to Glasgow Road where we live and then we brought it in and Dennis Kassau, who had built the entryway both on the east and the west, is using a similar technique as he did with the bar height stone that I just described with the cornerstones and a new signage is put together. Uh, the help on this has come from Kent Whitney, Whitney Monument Works, and so the lower portion of the sign tells about Indian Hills Community College being there the upper portion of the sign talks about the Carnegie Museum with our owl mm -hmm. as our logo, yep. and that is that is in there. And then on either side, these Carnegie uh, limestone pieces are being cut to portion, and there will be a tower on the north and a tower on the south to support uh, our new our new museum signage. And so that's coming along. I don't know what the weather is going to do to it. Whether it'll get completed this fall, but it is structurally secure and it's just the fine-tuning of putting the rest of the, the stones in place uh, for that signage on there. And, and Dave, I understand too that uh, along with now having the uh, bar height uh, masonry work and then next to that is the leapfrog uh, statues that we have which are now we have lighting on those uh, we will eventually have some lighting on our signage in front as well as you don't know about now but there's going to be a flagpole off to the side of that signage. So it's going to be well lit up in the evenings and uh, we think that's probably going to drive a lot more attendance into the museum because so many times that people come through the museum that lived in Fairfield eight, ten years, they had no idea that was even a museum and what it was, what, you know, what it was all about. So yeah. we're hoping this is going to drive up our attendance as well. One last piece that I want to share with you. Uh, many students who grew up in the Fairfield area would always have a, a tour when they were in fourth or fifth grade, and they would remember a buffalo head as you would go up the stairs from the second to the third floor. During our shutdown, during the COVID shutdown, we were able to hire a local fella, and he took the head down, took it to a workbench in the basement, went through and fluffed and buffed and retained and cleared the eyes and did all kind of stuff and then remounted it again. And so when you bring yourself, bring your family, bring your kids, uh, take an opportunity to take a look at that buffalo head that's been there for I don't know how many total years, mm -hmm. but it is mm -hmm. renovated and it's there to, to look down at you and, and it won't say boo, but it still, it looks, looks pretty good on there, so. We thank you for the opportunity to share with you, uh, listeners and watchers on this. Uh, this is our first opportunity to work directly with Werner on it. Hopefully there'll be more opportunities in the future. But the Carnegie Historical Museum at 112 South Court Street would welcome you to come along. If you'd like a group tour, we can arrange it, just as we have done with the high, Fairfield High School tours during the summer months on that. We appreciate your time and wish you well, but the invitation is always open. We're open Saturdays from 11 till 3, and then Monday through Friday from what, 12, 12, 12, 12 until 4 p.m. open mm -hmm. to the public. So it's, there'll be someone there that can assist you and get you toured around. Joe, anything to wrap up? Uh, no, just come on by and take a look. Uh, you're, you'll have a good, interesting day, and, and you can't see it all in one day, so come back again and, and see either the lower floor or the upper floor. We've got a lot to show you. Thank you. Thank you so very much.